and welcome to Hidden History Stories from the Secret City. I'm Keith McDaniel, along with my co-host, Ray Smith. Hello, Ray. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Keith, how are you today? I'm good, you know, uh, except uh, the last 24 hours, it appears that we've had China spying on us, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, they were flying over Tennessee, I think. I don't know that uh, they learned anything, though. What do you think? I think they uh, I saw online where somebody said, yeah, it's headed right for Oak Ridge. Uh, <laughs> we've been a target all our lives, so that's not well, a Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? <laughs> all right. Well, let's, uh, let's uh, get going. We've got a part two today, Ray. No. Yeah, we've got Tom Conkle with us today, and he's going to continue his discussion with us about the German uranium uh, from a, a different perspective than what we've looked at it before. So, Tom, if you want to continue your presentation, just go I ahead do. and share your screen and let's get going. Well, I thank you both for having me back for this and we'll get going on this. I'll uh, hit the button and uh, uh, see if we can actually find the, well, I'm not seeing it. Uh, Okay, we're going to have to uh, wait while I learn how to do this again. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Just go ahead and get it up on your screen. And then when you get it up, go back to your Zoom and share the screen. And then look for it okay. on your, uh, and your highlights. Oh, okay. Share screen. Uh-huh. Okay. Is that doing anything? Yeah, you're sharing your screen. But now you need to find your presentation. Okay, well, that's over in the, where the... You'll okay. have to, you may have to go out of the share screen in order to find it. Okay, I think that did it, didn't it? There we go. No, you got it. You're good to go. All right. We'll pick that up again and edit out around that a little bit. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for having me back, and we're going to get into part two of this presentation on um, balancing the books on uranium in the Third Reich. Just to uh, catch up a bit, a, a common thing that is done in evaluating nuclear programs throughout, throughout the world by the IAEA is to keep track of the uranium and see what people are doing with it. And I thought this would be a good thing to do for the Third Reich to find out how much uranium they had, what they were doing with it, and where it all ended up. And so in the first part of this presentation, we looked into how much uranium did they have? Where did it come from? And the two sources were uranium that came from Africa and was brought into Belgium by the UMHK, the Union Minerae de Hokutanga. It was being used for the production of mostly radium with some uranium business, very large stockpile, over 2,000 tons of war income in, Germany, in Belgium at the start of the war. In addition to that, there was a relatively small amount, perhaps 60 tons, that was mined in the Ore Mountains in Czechoslovakia. These are some of the world's oldest and richest ore mines for uranium. Those were the two sources. We looked at the people who, people being the industries and, and organizations that Germany who dealt with the uranium, that is the industries themselves, our Gesellschaft, and the Nazi organization, Rogues, the Rare Earths Handling Corporation, that actually bought and financed the purchase of the uranium. Then we looked at how much uranium was processed in Belgium by the UMHK processing plants and sent into Germany. So all this is quite well, quite well documented from post-war records that have become available. And so it leaves the question, what was there at the end of the war? And we're going to pick it up there as what was there at the end of the war. At the end of the war, in fact, even before the end of the war, there was a lot of interest in how much uranium there might be in Germany. And one of the charges to the Manhattan Engineer District, also its nuclear intelligence mission, was to make some effort to look for the special nuclear materials, that is the uranium. Now the actual charter to also was to investigate foreign intelligence sources concerning nuclear energy. So in a word, also was charged with and was primarily interested in enemy scientists and not enemy uranium. So their investigations into the German uranium were relatively superficial and in my opinion, not really very well done. It just, just wasn't in their charter. And we're all familiar with the German uranium that was found is a very small amount of the uranium in Germany, just about seven tons, six to seven tons have been made into uranium metal. 
a very small amount and it was of relatively poor quality. Analysis done at the time by the manufacturers of the uranium, analysis done soon after the war on samples returned by ALSOS, and analysis done today at Oak, uh, not Oak Ridge, uh, PNNL laboratory of samples of this uranium, all indicate a poor quality. I mentioned last time, the poor quality is so poor, you can still tell the mine it came from. There's so much trace material still in it. So my Manhattan Engineering District standards, not a suitable material for our program, but it's what they were using. Um, some of the uranium is uh, the metal itself continues to puzzle where it might have gotten of. And, and one odd episode, of, some of it was thrown into a river and had to be recovered from the river, perhaps not all of it's out, but it, it's, there's a lot of lore and tales about this, a fascinating subject on this little bit of German uranium uh, metal, but there really wasn't that much of it. Um, that was what we, the Americans did and the Brits working together and also, the Soviets had every bit of large interest in the German Atomic Energy Research Program as did the Brits and the Americans. They sent atomic search teams to search for the scientists, the materials. Um, the activities of these teams have been fairly thoroughly investigated post-war, in fact, into the 2000s, uh, yeah, the 2000s here by scientists at the All-Russian Scientific Research Institute of Experimental Physics. That's their Los Alamos. And they probably presumably had access to whatever original documents were available. So that's a contemporary look into it. There's some separate investigations that appeared in popular presses, and those go back to references from 1945. A lot of popular uh, source reports from uh, some of the scientists involved, but most importantly, is outlined in caps in this last thing. In the, in the um, 1990s, the now Russians put together and authored an extensive series of documents that just reproduce original letters, notes, factory orders from the beginning of their program. And that was put out in a large series of volumes under Red Diaf, one of the big names in their program. It's the official history of the Soviet nuclear program. There's much information in here, and these are original records. I always like to work from original records whenever possible. So we have some fairly good idea of how much materials the Russians found and removed. Um, but it turns out the most uh, detailed stories came from the um, office of the military government of the United States that moved in and, and um, well, they ruled. They were in administrative charge of the area of Germany and, and it was taken over by the United States of the four allies. They did a very thorough analysis of of the materials held by this firm Rose, which uh, the precious metal company. And they were mostly interested in gold and silver and diamonds and platinum and all those kinds of things. But they also produced the sheet and they looked into how much uranium they had. And it's a very detailed look into the uranium of some in Nazi Germany they could find. Now this is being done from records. They're not finding the uranium and weighing it or anything like that. They're just going through the receipts. In the storage loggers that were around, they called the storage house a logger. In these storage house, when you put something in, you got a receipt. When you took it out, you got a receipt. Everything was very thoroughly documented. There was a vast number of these receipts. Uh, the receipts from just the office in Rome filled two railway cars. When the Soviet atomic search teams reached Berlin and tried to find the receipts so they could search the receipts for the uh, evidence of the uranium program, they found it filled an entire built multi-story building and they and the people who ran up really weren't interested in helping them. So there was very voluminous information. Well, Amagas managed to go through it and put together a listing of where all the uranium was. Now this was the uranium that was held by the precious metal company and that's not the entire stockpile of uranium. This is the uranium that came from Belgium. It was bought by the Nazi government, by the Nazi Handling Corporation. So that's the detailed accounting here. Uh, not as good, but still substantial accounting of the uranium that came from the Czechoslovakian mines it was put together after the war, and that's also available. So those are sources of information on, on paper of how much uranium there should be in Nazi Germany at the end of the war. 
Now, another thing that was done is investigation. Who all was using this uranium? What companies were involved? This is the rounding up the usual suspects, you might say, from the movie Casablanca of the companies involved in the who were dealing with the uranium in Nazi Germany. Some of these we've always already discussed with one of the larger Auer Gazelle Schacht we discussed. That's where most of the work was done. But the rest of these companies also dealt in uranium. We're gonna come by one of them pretty soon and discussion to that famous uranium that was aboard German submarine U-234 at the end of the war. But this gives you some place to start looking through company records. People have looked through the company records to try to find it's been possible to put together a connection chart for what happened to all the uranium. And we're not going to have time to go on this chart, but this is just showing you sources of uranium, where it was moved, when it was placed into stockpiles, when it was taken out of stockpiles and used in various things, various technical activities. The blue squares up here have to do with the operations in Belgium of the UMHK concern that, that managed the uh, African uranium wars that were in country at the beginning of the, of the war. So all those blue things are tons of uranium, atomic tons in this case, uh, tons of uranium atoms being moved out of their stockpiles, sent to plants to be processed into uranium compounds. That's the, I don't know if we can see my uh, mouse pointer here, but that's these companies down here, the uranium refining countries. There were four of these loggers that it was stored in, that the uranium would be stored in. And this is the largest one, but here's the one in Berlin. There was two others that were where uranium had moved at the end of the war, the very end of the war. But you can follow the flow of uranium. It comes in and leaves the loggers. It goes over to the Our Rare Earths Company where the uranium oxides are made into purified oxides. Then it can it goes off for smelting that is reduction from the oxides to the metal. That's done at the Gausa in Frankfurt and a second company was purposely built here in the outskirts of Berlin. After it's been smelted into small particles, it's then melted again and recast into plates and sheets. Those are those things, those cubes, they're coming out of here at the Gausa Frankfurt factory. Um, there was a bit of uranium material done at a small wartime relocation facility in a village outside of Zeckman, Germany. I mean, this is a hamlet. And all this is being done in a mill house warehouse. It's just a wooden building with one guy in there. And he's melting and recasting uranium all by himself there. So uh, sort of an interesting wartime operation. A little bit of the uranium metal was then sent to Farben who made it in the uranium hexafluoride, the um, hexafluoride, the white salt production, very little made compared to the United States program of the Manhattan Engineer District. There was also some commercial uses. Broccoli and Krupp, the two large weapon manufacturers, received about seven tons of metal from de Gaussa. And this metal, had it been through the purification process, it just came out of the lager, was sent to de Gaussa, then sent up for rough and proof. About a ton of that was recovered at the end of the war. And that's believed to perhaps been used in a high density penetrators, you know, or uranium round basically. And that's mentioned in, and by uh, German weapons authorities, but none of those have actually been found. Um, down at the bottom here, I've taken everything we normally talk about, and it's in that light orangey red box, right? That ribbon down at the bottom. All these other things you may be hearing about, I've condensed back into there into the German atomic energy research programs. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the flow of the uranium into those programs. Now it's been possible to establish quite accurately where the uranium went. I'm gonna discuss that in a minute and where it ended up. And so these little balloons here, I'm showing 24 down here. There were 24 atomic tons of uranium that were delivered to the atomic energy research programs. Here you'd need, uh, here's 370 atomic tons still in storage, nothing ever done with. It was just in storage. Um, the, green, the green things are, are things also takes and the red things are things that the Russians, the Soviets took at the time. And there's one other symbol on you here, you see, which are these triangles. 
that's where uranium is missing at the end of the war. So there's records showing it should have been there, but it wasn't found. And the big amount of this is a logger, a storage in Landsberg, Germany, which is now over in uh, Poland, uh, was never found. That uranium is still unaccounted for. And that's what we're going to be talking about in some detail, a little bit more detail. But the takeaway here is it's been possible to, to trace using the bookkeeping, the flow of uranium from the, the mines and the stockpiles as it was used in Germany, where it went through the loggers, what was done with it. And you know, it all works out okay. In the final numbers, the not counting the numbers match. Is there a 717 atomic tons of uranium in the European stocks at UMHK at the start of the war and about 36 tons of atomic, atomic tons, like tons of uranium atoms were produced in Germany from the Central European mines, Joachim Stahl and other mines in Czechoslovakia. So they had about seven, there should have been about 753 atomic tons of uranium at the end of the war. And well, although we can't find all of it, at least in bookkeeping, it's all still there. It balances to within a ton of uranium atoms. And considering the accuracy of the numbers, that this match is nothing more than a coincidence. But it does show to the accuracy of the data, the books match with all of the uranium account atoms accounted for. So we don't have, this is bookkeeping accounting. Uh, actually finding them is a different, different subject, but at least by bookkeeping, they're all still there. And as I say here, some of it's missing. We got missing Nazi uranium. It has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Missing Nazi uranium. So by bookkeeping, it was all there, but not all of it was found. And in particular, 147 tons of the orange oxide. So these are the tons of the oxide, how much the oxide weigh. And 700 tons, uh, 6.75 tons of uh, uh, ADH at the Rager and Logsbur on the Wartha, Wartha's River in Poland. Um, just wasn't found. Don't know what happened to it. This logger was, uh, uh, these loggers were uranium and other precious metals and, and goods were stored, were run by private companies. And so that's Rose, the company, the Nazi corporation, will contract with the private country company to run the storage logger. This one was ran by Transport Cooperative of Berlin. It's an inland land waterway shipping company. So this is just a trans shipping point. They've just moved it in, they're holding it, waiting for instructions to deliver it somewhere else. Um, we don't know what happened to the stuff. There was a bunch of other stuff there, 2,000 tons of zinc and 2,600 tons of copper, both very scarce commodities in wartime Germany were also being held in this logger. Uh, we know the, the white of Russian army overran the place on 30th January, 1945, but they made no indication of finding precious metals in these things. The Soviet atomic search team made no indication of this. They actually, appear never to have learned of the existence of this materials from the records they went through. So the Soviet records indicate the senior scientists and administrators at our gazelle shot were unaware of the red Landsberg uranium is in discussing the, the Russians uh, interviewed, we'll put it that way. You can imagine what a Russian interview with a German might have been in April of 1945 is it was actually the NKVD came and did some of these interviews. And the scientists were very self and administrators were very forthcoming with what they knew. And what they told the Russians turned out to be accurate is where they said uranium was, uranium was found and the amounts found, but none of them knew about this stash of uranium at Lonsberg over in what was had been overran in what's now Poland. So it's a bit of a puzzle. This wasn't known, it wasn't found by the Russians, and it wasn't well known even within the German people the specifically tasked with it. As we know where it was, is the street of the dress of this given. It was um, on the Wattwarther River in, in Landsberg, uh, Landsberg's uh, now a town in, in Poland whose name I cannot pronounce, so I won't try to pronounce it. But this just shows a World War II map in the bottom right here and a contemporary view on Google Earth of where that building was. It's since been torn down. There's just a vacant lot there today. 
is there was a decrepit brick building into the early 2000s and then just torn down and uh, nothing's been done with it since. But don't know why this material was here. It was likely in transit going somewhere and it's just been stopped here at this particular spot. Uh, th this uh, transport company, TGB, had many dozens of these stations along the rivers in Germany. And this was just another of their stations. Evidently, rogues had hired them to store material at this station for some time, it was being stored there. It was probably being shipped from somewhere else to somewhere else, but we don't know where. Um, fascinating possibility is Germans were very good at, at record keeping, still are very good at record keep, keeping. And I'm hopeful that the successor corporation might still have the wartime transit records of materials flowing in and out of this storage location. I've tried to contact them by email, but my German's terrible. I didn't get much of a reply back. Is one of the things I'd like to do in the in the future is have somebody with better skills at this type of task go talk to them and find out if the wartime records still exist, which would track down more on where the uranium was being moved around the country. Uh, but the bottom line of all this, there was no significant production of fissile material in Nazi Germany is the raw materials, the feed materials, as we would have called them, the Manhattan Engineer District that would have been used for this were all still there at the end of the war. They hadn't been con converted into uh, unknown amounts of uranium metal at an unknown location. They weren't processed into the white salt uranium hexafluoride and passed through uranium enrichment schemes. Uh, there was no evidence that there was missing uranium that would have been moved, used for a nuclear reactor. So this is the usual standard that uh, the IAEA might use to establish whether there is a nuclear weapon program occurring in one of their monitored countries. This is just what's being monitored to make sure you, all of the uranium is where you say it is and it's not being used for a nuclear weapon program. It's pretty well established now that there is just no fissile material production in Nazi Germany. Uh, still some mysteries. Um, the orange oxide, the uranium trioxide, that was said to be stored in, in two of the loggers, that was not produced by the plants in, in, in Belgium. The uranium refining operations there did not produce this orange oxide. Um, Somewhere during the year, during the war, someplace in Germany, probably at our Gesellschaft in the Oranienburg plant, is they converted some of the other uranium species, uranium oxides, into this uranium trioxide. That's a very common thing in the uranium business. It's a very common product today, and, and uranium, as it's being refined for use in reactor fuel, it goes through this orange oxide process. So there's nothing really unusual about it, except why did they do it? What were they gonna do with it? It's sort of a puzzle. I, I think it can be argued the most significant accomplishment of the wartime German uranium program was the production of orange oxide. But the reason they produced it's unknown. Just uh, one can speculate, but just don't know anything about it. Um, that's what we found from the investigation. But a few interesting things came up along the way. One of them is the Alsos accounting for the uranium. When Alsos moved into, started their operations in Belgium in September of 1944, they went by the headquarters building of UMHK and examined the records. And at that time, they looked at the same records we look at today, I mean, quite literally the same records. In their own writing, they came to the conclusion there were 335 atomic tons of uranium in refined products that had been shipped into Germany during the war. So this was the also conclusion in the fall of 1944. So in the early fall of 44, the Manhattan Engineering District knew that hundreds of tons of refined, of refined uranium materials were on the loose in Germany. Now I call this an elephant in the room, which is just an obvious topic no one wants to talk about. We call it an elephant in the room. The elephant in the room here is that although Alsos knew about this, they never did anything about it. And it was just not discussed again. They spent some time looking into the uranium production. 
they did a quite abbreviated interview with some of the people who worked in the uranium metal production. They got a basically good accounting for how much metal had been made. And, but they must have been aware that the metal was no more than a few percent of the uranium known to have been sent into Germany. They did not make accounting for what happened to the rest. And I think I know why this is. I found information that actual documents, the, the, I can't say they're orders, but they're policy documents, that the concern that the Russians or the Germans would learn of our atomic en energy program, that we had the Manhattan Project building an atomic bomb, they didn't want to show any undue interest in the uranium. So there was actually a prohibition on looking too carefully into these, and they didn't do it. But still, it's perplexing why Alsace documents contain no discussion of this elephant in the room represented by the hundreds of tons of uranium compounds known to be unlocated in Germany. And I say this may have come from this February 45 prohibition on activities which might disclose undue interest in the details of German atomic energy research, as it says on the document. But we continued to ignore the elephant. In fact, Rose himself, who knew about this, ignored it. And in April of 1945, soon after the discovery of the material in the Stassfurt lager, the road locker in Stassfurt, Grove sent a letter to General Marshall and, the, uh, and uh, informing him of this discovery. And here's the quote from it. It says, we have found all the uranium in Germany and with the capture of this material, which was the bulk of the uranium available in Germany, there seems to definitely remove any possibility of Germans make use of an atomic bomb in this war. So this is just the conclusion I told you about, but Groves knew it wasn't true. In point of fact, he erred badly. He said there were 1,200 tons of African ore the Germans had come into possession with, but actually it was 2,040 tons and he knew that. So there were still those 374 atomic tons of uranium unaccounted for in Germany. So why Groves would tell his superiors that he had found all the uranium in Germany, it's, it's mystifying. He was perfectly aware he had not. Um, as the military chief, Groves knew perfectly aware there were hundreds of tons of refined uranium products on the loose somewhere in Germany. And he knew that it turns out in a, document Groves himself put together in December 1944 concerning enemy production of atomic bombs. He correctly assessed there were somewhat over 700 atomic tons of uranium in Germany. So as of December 44, he knew the answer. And he also knew that's not how much they had found. So how can it be aired so badly? It's a history question I'm curious about. And there's another way he could have he could have told the General Marshall so about it. Would Groves have been comfortable advising Marshall that only half of the German uranium had been found and that there were 374 atomic tons of accounted, unaccounted for refined material? And that was a bit more than the 356 atomic tons of uranium used in all three of the massive MED uranium enrichment plants combined. I don't think the General Marshall would have been too pleased to hear of the actual situation, but that's it. The amount of missing material unaccounted for in Germany was more than used at that time in all three of the big MED uranium enrichment plants combined. So it's a very substantial amount of material. But as we know from numbers I just saw you, it really was still all there at the end of the war. It hadn't gone anywhere. Um, this came back to have another effect. In the immediate post-war years, the subject of Russian uranium was of great interest to the Allied intelligence community. We were trying to predict uh, when it was the Soviets might have their first atomic bomb. And the authorities had felt that uranium would be the limiting factor in the Soviet drive for an atomic bomb. And so there was a lot of work put in to try and figure out how much uranium the Soviets might have. Uh, the activities of the uranium mining 
in the Ore Mountains, the sections of Czechoslovakia that fell under Soviet control, were being very carefully monitored by various techniques, uh, signals intelligence, and uh, sort human sources on the ground. So that was thought to be the supply of uranium that the Soviets had. But what was missed is they came into possession of much of that 374 atomic tons of uranium. They got about a 200 tons of it and sent it back. And that brought forward the date of their first atomic alum test by about two years, actually. So it's curious that this, this an appreciation for the missing German uranium came back to adversely affect the US intelligence community in its assessment of the date of the first Soviet nuclear test. A little thing I found, which is just I got a chuckle about, is on 8th September 1949, the CIA recommended against uh, Dr. Uwe, who was in charge of the uranium production at Auer, the person who knew most about it, being brought to the U.S. noting that there's no record of the subject having done scientific work, apparently as an industrial manager but he was the industrial manager of their uranium production program. So it, it seemed like quite a unappreciation of the importance of individuals that the person most knowledgeable of the German uranium program was thought to be not worth their time in interviewing. Um, by the way, just days later after this interview, and we learned the Soviets conducted their first nuclear test on 29th August, 1949. So they'd already done their test when the CIA wrote this memo. The CIA just didn't know about it at the time. So that was an event speeded up by a year or more by these hundreds of tons of uranium. Um, just to belabor this, you know, I come from the intelligence community and we're always about, you know, don't louse up and miss things. Soon after the war, Groves had famously pined to be 20 years before the Soviets had the bomb. In a 1970 interview, he stated his underestimate was based primarily on their lack of uranium. Then he mentions in this document that they found out in 1947 from a Belgian connection about the missing uranium, which of course our people never found out about that. No, his people did find out about that. They knew about it in the fall of 1944 and so did he. Uh, so I think Rose was dissembling here. Um, our people, including Groves, they were well aware of it. So I'm not sure, once again, why Groves was making these statements that can be contradicted by official his own official documents. Uh, one other thing I want to look into is uh, a famous meeting that was held in, on 4th June 1942 between Olive Speer and the German scientist about the fate of the, what was going to be with the German Atomic Energy Research Program. I want to put the date of this meeting in context. Just before there, the military commander in Belgium had ordered the requisition of all of the uranium held by Union Minerai, UHK, and its removal to Germany. Prior to this, it had still been owned by the Belgian and was, re and it was residents in Belgium. But here they condemned it. They told them they were going to buy it and they purchased it for a fair price, by the way, about 4.15 million Reichsmarks. But this was done by the Spear Ministry. It was the Spear Ministry buying this stuff. So on when, at the date of the 4th June 1942 meeting, Spear and his senior munitions ministry officials and officers were, were where they were buying up all of the uranium in Belgium and sending it to, uh, to Germany. Now, th this conference is very well known. I'm not going to go over it. The basic thing is Spear was pressing atomic scientists how much money they needed. And they were, he was just getting ridiculously low bids. Like Van Weizsäcker wanted 40,000 Reich marks. And Field Marshal Mills recalled, it was such a ridiculously low figure that Speer looked at me and we shook our heads at the artlessness and naivety of these people. Speer actually told the scientists they could have any funds they wanted. And the scientists came up with a figure of 2 million Reich marks. So they just spent 4 million Reichmarks buying the uranium in Belgium and sending it into Europe. And the scientists want a total budget of $2 million for atomic energy research. So it's pretty clear the Reich Minister and the General Field Marshal are on some different page of the playbook on 
the atomic scientists. It just shows the scientists were unaware of the ongoing financial commitments to uranium acquisition and the true size of the amount of uranium being purchased and brought into the Reich. Um, we've shown this graph from the one. This is a graph that comes from um, UMHK sources. It's just showing the years going by from January 40 to January 1945 and showing the total production in U308 tons of equivalent of uranium from the Belgium sources. And you see it just marching up. As I said, we cross-checked these numbers by looking at the consumption of ore and the actual deliveries into Germany. Numbers look fine. They dash lines the date of the 6 June 1942 conference of Spear. So although the famous atomic scientists, Heisenberg and that bunch, um, requested a very tiny budget and not really much was done in the way of atomic energy research since then, you know, it didn't have any effect on the production of refined uranium products and their shipment into the Reich. And why the, this program of uranium procurement was so detached from the famous atomic scientist is still a puzzle to me. Why were they buying this stuff, paying to have it refined, a small portion of it refined and shipped into Germany? Do not know. Um, I call this looking under the street light, by the way, is the general gist of ALSOS in, involvement in, in, in the German and estimating the German uranium program is they were going to go ask the ger famous German scientists what they were doing. The idea was being, as it puts here, no one but Professor Heisenberg could be the brains of a German uranium project, and every physicist throughout the world knew that. So the major thrust of the also efforts was to identify about a dozen key German atomic nuclear scientists and go talk to them and ask them what they did. Well, it's puzzling when you look at it because in actuality, Heisenberg knew more about the crucial facts of the geranium German uranium program, how much uranium do they have, what they were doing with, then he did the backside of the moon, is you know, trying to find out, answer basic questions about the uranium program in Germany by talking to Heisenberg was, well, he didn't know, why were you doing this? But in point of fact, that June conference had no effect on the German uranium program. It didn't, doesn't seem to have been anything to do with the famous atomic scientist. A uh, few question comes up. Uh, was Nazi uranium dropped on Hiroshima? We, we that is, also confiscated a lot of uranium, sent it back to the United States. As near as we can tell, it was just mixed into our supplies of raw materials and ran through the processes. But in September 44, also it's recovered about 68 atomic tons, UO3A equivalent tons of ammonium diurinate, black oxide, and were from the facilities in Belgium, and that was shipped to the U.S. And it's been claimed occasionally this uranium was subsequently enriched, formed into the shapes needed for little boy, and dropped on Hiroshima. Could have this happened? Well, we don't know. What I think is most probable is this small amount of uranium, and I say small amount because about 1,400 tons of uranium were processed between the MED, between the date this material arrived in the United States in June. Remember, we're talking about 68 tons out of 1,400 tons. And I'm guessing it just got shipped to a big pile of uranium in St. Louis, mixed in with the raw materials and sent through our feed materials processing. So it's a drop in the bucket compared to how much we have. And yeah, I guess it's possible that uranium atoms that came from Germany, that came from Belgium, that came from Africa were mixed in and finally those atoms were incorporated into the highly enriched uranium and Hiroshima device. But I don't think this is either can be confirmed nor denied from existing records. Certainly they didn't go out of their way. They the Manhattan engineer district to specifically use the uranium return from, from Nazi Germany and our nuclear weapon program here in the United States. The graph on the right just shows, by the way, the total productions of uranium, accumulated production and, and U tons U308 and the, and, the, and the American program. This is coming up like 4,000 tons here, 3,000 tons 
here in 1945, and we're talking about recovering 68 tons. I say it was a drop in the bucket. Um, German uranium and submarine 234, famous story. This submarine surrendered at the end of the war to the US Navy. It was uh, ordered uh, sail to the east coast of the United States. They looked through it. It was on its way out to Japan with a bunch of materials for the Japanese being exchanged under the Japanese-German cooperation. Amongst it was uranium. And there's been innumerable books written about the submarine and the uranium that was on it and much speculation about what it was. Well, we know what it was. Um, I mentioned that number of companies that were involved in the German uranium program. It, it turns out that Reiner Karsch, a, a historian in Germany, went through the records and actually found the bill of sale for the uranium that was on the submarine. It was technically 82 to 80% uranium yellow oxide, that's sodium diurinate. It was sold in November 43. It took them a long time to try to get it here. It was packed up in 20 small wooden barrels and it was evidently 11 of those small wooden barrels were aboard submarine U-234. So it's just a, a common uranium oxide that had been bought. We know the price that they paid and all that kind of stuff on its own way. Interesting though, this same comp trading company, uh, Shoa Tasua Kisia Limited, that handled the purchase here in Germany of the uranium that was placed on U-235, had opened an office in New York City on 11th March, 1940, which is coincident in time when the first shipments of uranium ore and refined products were being made in New York City. So they seem to have a long time interest in trying to, occur, to um, purchase some small amount of this uranium for use in, the, in Germany, I end up Japan somewhere. Uh, there's a few lingering questions about the whole thing. And the big one to me is the cost and the pace of wartime production of finished uranium products doesn't fit well with the standard narrative of the German atomic energy research. They were buying and buying at good cost, and they being the precious metal company, a Nazi organization, buying uranium out of the Belgium stockpile, having it refined, they were paying to have it refined and shipped into Germany. And those amounts were much larger than any known use in the wartime German atomic energy research. So it's, it's a, this is decoupled from the German wartime programs. Don't know what they're doing with this. But it comes back as, why was more uranium paid for and delivered after the atomic research project had been by more, and it's a puzzling thing to me, substantially more money was spent on pure procuring uranium than was spent on atomic energy research. As I, I say, they spent more money on buying uranium from the Belgians than they did in the actual atomic energy research programs. Does it make a lot of sense? Can't think of any other use for uranium that they have in mind. Um, the amount of finished uranium products obtained by Rogues, the, the Nazi trading company, were much largely can be attributed to known uranium needs. Approximately 31 atomic tons of uranium were used in the exponential pile and enrichment projects. An exponential pile is the technical name for those nuclear research reactors that the, that the Germans were building. We built them here in the United States too. They called them exponential piles. They were subcritical reactors. Is our first reactor, CP1, Chicago Pile 1, actually operated as an exponential pile for about a month before sufficient uranium was added to make it go supercritical and become a critical nuclear reactor. So those were exponential pile experiments and they had small enrichment projects, but they purchased 338 atomic tons and and sent it into Germany during the war. Uh, reported industrial uses of the uranium metal in wartime Germany amounted to a few tons. So it's just a continuous puzzle of why they were doing that. And then the big thing is the fate of that 153 atomic tons of missing Nazi uranium remains a mystery. I think it would be fascinating to find out what happened to this stuff. What was what last reported, reported, I say, in Landsberg, Germany, what happened to it after that? And there's so many things you can dream up. And I want to tell you just one little story that really did happen. 
When the Soviet atomic search teams entered Berlin looking for the uranium, they found a little bit had been transferred over to a, a chemical firm that had a smelting operation, a, a second smelting operation underway. And they tracked that down and they found the Russian military had already found this material. And it was in these barrels and it was this lovely yellow color. They thought it was paint pigment. They had painted their headquarters building with uranium oxide paint, to make it look nice and yellow. So maybe the 153 tons was, well, used for paint pigment for all I know. Maybe there's a lot of yellow houses in Brown Landsberg, hard to say, but we just don't know what happened to it. And it would be fascinating to track it down. Now there's one loose end here. There's one loose end here. When uranium is run through an enrichment plant, most of it comes out as depleted uranium tails. Only a very small amount is actually in the highly enriched uranium. So the caveat I have on that is I don't know what those 153 atomic tons of missing uranium were. If this was 153 tons of missing uranium, depleted uranium, that is the tails from an enrichment plant, that would be a very significant change to the, our appreciation of the history of the German Atomic Energy Research Program. Now, I don't believe that. There's no reason to believe or no knowledge of how the, Rus how the Russians, the Germans would have ran a large uranium enrichment plant. But in point of fact, we do have this 153 atomic tons of missing uranium. And you know, those could conceivably be the tails out of a uranium enrichment plant. If you saw this in another country, suppose we were balancing the books in lower Albonia, I'm making up a country. That's a Dilbert's country, of course, is what he's talking about. And IAE did this and found there were 153 tons of missing uranium. You'd want to find out where that stuff was because that's a very significant amount. I point out that's more than went through the big MED uranium enrichment plants during the war. So this is a large amount and still a puzzle where it went to. So I regard finding this as, as just a great mystery to be solved, a lingering problem and just a marvelous fun thing to do in retirement. So that's what I wanted to tell you guys about. Just to summarize, we could track out the flow of uranium through the German program, at least in a bookkeeping sense, it was all still there at the end of the war. It wasn't siphoned off into a big plant somewhere, but we still are missing this 153 tons. And until that's accounted for, there's still some uncertainty in this analysis. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate that you went into the uranium on U-234. Uh, you know, there's been a program on the History Channel about it. And as you said, books have been written uh, about it. Uh, the uh, question about what was done with it, whether Oppenheimer ever met with it or would it come to Y-12, those kinds of thoughts have, uh, have been discussed. Um. Let me talk about that just a bit, Ray. One of the right. stories, and there's actually an, an excellent uh, PBS production on the uranium on submarine U-234. But one of the claims that is made in there by a, one of the crew members is he saw a person come into the storage room who looked a lot like Oppenheimer. And he was treated with deference and respect. And yeah. so we've been trying to track down from our own Los Alamos laboratory records, Oppenheimer's whereabouts during this time. Could, it, could he conceivably have, have, have visited this storage warehouse and looked at this? So far, we haven't tracked down the records sufficiently, but that's on our list of things to do. Just double check. Yeah. Is there any chance that JRO yeah. actually went over and had a look at this material? Yeah, I, I appreciate you doing that. I think that's worthy of investigation. Uh, and it'd be interesting to know if you if you can determine that he actually was ever there or had the possibility of being there. The other question I have is to clarify for our viewers the difference. But when you mention atomic tons, how, how does that differ? Give me a little bit of, of the facts about the different kind of measurements. Okay, that, the, these are confusing in their, in their 
inexact apocryphal units. You can think of it taking a ton of uranium atoms. So that's an atomic ton of uranium, ton of uranium atoms. And you can chemically combine them with things. You could take that and you could hang three oxygens on it and make uranium trioxide, the, yeah. uh, the orange oxide. Well, yeah. now your ton of uranium is had oxygen applied to it. So you've got a higher number of tons of uranium trioxide because the oxygen also yeah. weighs more. So and one of the common things that used is the tons of U308. And so for each ton of U308, there, there's 740 kilograms, 0.74 ton, atomic tons of uranium. Atom. And when you're following the uranium around, you got to account for the uranium atoms and yeah. not all those atoms that it may be chemically combined with. So this concept of an atomic ton of uranium is the concept of counting the atoms of uranium. How much uranium do you have there? And that's very common in, in nuclear business when you're doing nuclear chemistry, uh, fission products and such, you count atoms. You gotta count for all the atoms. You don't attack, count for the atomic compounds. So that's the confusing thing there. Got now, it, wanna, that, that helps. Okay, I, now I wanna add with, just end with one, one further slide. Okay. I got a picture here in the center of some people sitting at a cafe under a street light. Okay. And there's an old mind you can look because everything else is dark. And you know, that's a little bit what also did in their, in their uh, investigation. They, they followed the famous German atomic scientists they did what was easy. They looked under the street light. But around mm. that, there's a series of operations. And it starts in the lower left hand. You took 850 tons of African ore as bought, taken from the rogues lager at this, at this place in Stasford, and shipped into Belgium, where the mm -hmm. two Belgium refining plants spent four years and 4.15 million Reich marks making 335 tons of uranium, refined uranium products, which is shipped into Germany at the average rate of eight tons per month, where our gazelle shop, we don't know this for sure, but it appears, employed an army of about 2,000 camp laborers, they call that, they're known as slave laborers today, uh, to produce 160 tons of the orange oxide, that's the UO3 I mentioned, which was put onto a barge and shipped to a logger at Lands never to be seen again. Hmm. So it just uh, wraps up the, you know, my interest in this is the, what's happening around the ALSOS investigations seems to be more interesting than what ALSOS was investigating. <laughs> well, that makes, the point, today. Yeah, that makes the point very clear. And I really appreciate your perspective. Having an, a, a career that you've had in intelligence you understand the distinctions between what is known and what is overlooked often by not knowing exactly where to look in the shadows. So I think your insights are unique in being able to share with us uh, this information about German uranium. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this for us. Well, I thank you for having me and I, See you, gentlemen. I'm guessing at some future time we'll think of some oh, other things to discuss. Yes, we, we, we will. Yeah, we'll continue this connection. And when you get to Oak Ridge, I'll be glad to show you around. And uh, if I get the opportunity, I'll, I'll catch up with you either at Los Alamos or maybe at the Nevada test site. I think we should bump into each other at the old Nevada test site is the next time we should see each other. All right. I'll plan on it. I think that'll be good. All right, very good. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Ray, who do we have lined up for our next uh, our next one? Our, our next one will be Ronnie Bogard, uh, uh, Rhonda. She will be talking to us about the Weinberg Project. And uh, we've inserted this part two in just because of the amount of material that we had from Tom. But right. we'll be on our regular schedule to get, uh, get more insight into the Weinberg Papers Project next time. All right. Very good. All right, folks. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it. And 
We'll be back in about a week or so.